Welcome to church. Today, Pastor OJ is starting our new series, Thriving in Edmonton, where he'll be talking about how we can move from simply surviving to thriving in this season. If you're new here, we love to connect. You can message us on Facebook, Instagram, or simply by texting hello to 587-323-1199 and we'll respond right back. I'm so glad you could join us today. How are we doing? Doing good? Welcome to all those of you in the main floor, those in the balcony, and those in the lower auditorium. And welcome to all those of you that are online this morning, or whenever you're going to watch this later. We welcome you. God bless you. Today, uh, we begin a new series. And the series is entitled Thriving in Edmonton. Thriving in Edmonton. Uh, the first message is actually has the title Surviving or Thriving. Surviving or Thriving. Uh, the definition I'm using for surviving is continuing to live or to exist. While thrive could be defined as growing, prospering, flourishing. So the question are you just existing, living your life in a holding pattern, or are you continuing to grow, continuing to flourish? How would you honestly answer that question this morning? Just take a moment and think about it. Am I surviving? Am I just surviving? Or am I thriving? Now I get it. Life can be hard. Life can bring some deep challenges some deep disappointments, and some significant losses. This past week, on April 8th, would have been my mom's birthday. And uh, just really, really missed her as we went through this week. Last year, we celebrated her 90th birthday by waving at her through a window from a parking lot because we were restricted from entry to be able to go see her. She was looking pretty good at that time. However, she quickly declined after that. And uh, this past June on Father's Day, she passed away, entered into the joy of the Lord. But for us that are left behind, life has difficult moments, doesn't it? This fall, my wife Barb, her mother had a heart attack, which she recovered from, and then right after her recovery, she fell, uh, breaking her hip, and consequently died as a result of complications from the broken, uh, broken uh, hip bone, the femur, the big part of the leg. And uh, it's not unusual that seniors will die from complications coming from a fall. However, due to COVID restrictions, Barb was the only one from the family that was able to go in to see her those last days. So the rest of her children, the rest of her grandchildren said goodbye to, to their mother, to their grandmother, with Barb holding the cell phone to her ear. Life has difficult moments. I get it. We all encounter difficult moments in life. And some difficult moments last longer than others. And unfortunately, some of us get stuck in those difficult moments, and we just stay there. Some of us this morning might feel literally like we are drowning. We're just coming up for air long enough to grasp some air, just to survive. We may be in a severe relationship crisis. We may be in a... a family crises, financial crises, a health crisis, maybe a job loss type crises, business crises. We may be grieving the loss of a loved one. Many of you lost loved ones this last year. Sometimes a number of these different crises hit us all at the same time. And at those moments at that time, it seems like simply surviving is actually a win. It's been said by some, 
I'm not sure if this would be true for me, but it's been said for some, this past year has been the most challenging year of many people's lives. In the midst of the challenges and the difficulties, many people this last year have gone into what I would call the survival mode. You may be in that place today where the circumstances of life Whatever those circumstances are, but the circumstances of life have taken you where you did not want to go. Now I think for most of us, the COVID-19 pandemic issues and related issues have taken our lives to places where we did not want to go. Now the scripture narrative that we're going to be looking at today from the Old Testament is a true story of the Israelite people being taken to a place they did not want to go. Nebuchadnezzar, a Babylonian king, attacked Judah twice, conquered the city of Jerusalem, and then the Babylonians ransacked that city, burned the temple, and they took all the capable leaders, all the artists, craftsmen, priests, prophets, into captivity, leaving behind only the weak and the old in Judah to take care of the land. Against their will, the people were taken as captives to a place they had not chosen to go, Babylon. So like the Israelites today, you may feel you are being held in captivity by the current circumstances of your life. Now in Babylon, the Israelite captives, they grieved for the loss of their land. They grieved for all the loss. They began to lose hope and they became depressed and they went into a survival mode of simply existing. And we pick up the narrative, the true story of their account in Jeremiah 29 verse 1 this morning, and this is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people that Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. And it goes on in verse 4 to say, this is what the Lord all Almighty, the God of Israel says to all those I have carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Let's just pause there for a moment. We'd ask the question, were the Israelites exiled or sent to Babylon? Well, actually, the original Hebrew wording contains both meanings. When it is fully translated, could have been translated, I have caused you to be carried away captive. In other words, God is saying to the Israelites, I've allowed this, I've actually caused it, to you to be exiled to the city of Babylon. You've been sent to that city by me. Now whether we notice it or not, God's invisible hand guides our lives. None of you are here this morning by accident. None of you are joining us online today by accident. You are alive today and living uh, where you are and you are living for a purpose. Paul goes on to explain the sovereignty of God in, uh, in placing people throughout the earth in his discussion with the Athens as he's in a discussion with them. And we pick this account up in Acts 17, verse 26. And this is what the Apostle Paul says. He says, God made, began by making one man, and from him he made all the different people who live everywhere in the world. He decided exactly when and where they would live. It was God who determines our time and allocates set places for us to live. Why are you living in Edmonton? My wife asks me that all the time. Why are we living here? (laughs) Well, because we've been called here. (laughs) Now, some of you might feel like literally you've been exiled here. You've been exiled here. 
especially this morning when you came out and you had to get out the scraper and scrape all that snow off of your window this morning. Actually, it wasn't bad. Being a realistic optimist, I was happy about the snow because I had just done my spring cleanup. And I'll take the moisture any way I can get it. Be good for the lawn. But I'll admit, many times at minus 30, as I come out and to scrape my vehicle, I'm saying, why do I live here? <laughs> Some of you may have been born here like I was. Some of you may have jo- moved here for job purposes. Others may have moved here because of marriage, education, for medical uh, purposes, business, or for ministry. But the present place where you are living today, whether it's in Edmonton or you're watching this online from some other city, the present place where you are living is no coincidence. And God's sovereignty, he has led your life so you would be living in the city where you are living. God has led that we would be here and alive right during this pandemic time. It's not an accident. Whether you realize it or not, you have been sent here for now by God's purpose. So what's that purpose? What's that purpose? Are you surviving or are you thriving? Well, let's go on. And we'll pick it up in verse uh, 8 of Jeremiah 28. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. So the context is, they were receiving prophetic words. Hey, in two years, you're going back. In two years, this is all over. They were receiving misleading messages from the prophets which were causing them to accept a survival attitude. And they were just kind of hanging out or surviving until we're out of here. Now the reality was this. They were going to be there for 70 years. Which means that most of them would die in Babylon. In other words, their entire life would be lived out there in exile. And if they didn't change their attitude... They would spend their entire life living in a survival mode. Now, while this letter that Jeremiah writes is written to a specific people at a specific time and place for a specific purpose, I believe that some of the principles that Jeremiah addresses in this letter are general principles that are translatable to us today. They're translatable, some of them. The reality is this, that we're not in this world permanently. We're just passing through. We have a better place that is prepared for us. This is not it. And by the way, retirement will not be your heaven if you're a believer. It's not it. See, the Bible uses things like pilgrim, traveler, indicating that we're just passing through. We're on a journey. And this is not our permanent destination. And we know that Jesus, he's coming back to get us. Jesus is coming back for his church. Understand that. And that is a reality. Just as it was a reality that God was going to bring back the exiles out of captivity, in the same way it is a reality that Jesus will come back for his church. But because of that truth, because of that reality, we may have adopted a survival attitude of complacency in our life. We may have the attitude, I'm just going to withdraw into my Christian bubble 
and stay in the survival mode. I just want to protect myself and my family, make sure we're okay, and whatever craziness is going out of my, in our world, I don't want to engage in that. We might have done that because we're waiting for Jesus to come. Or we're thinking, you know, when I die, either Jesus comes or I dies, but either way, I'm out of here. But here's the reality. I want us to think about this. The reality is that we will all spend our lifetime on this earth, right? It's a reality. How many, ever many years that may be, we will spend our lifetime on this earth. And if we continue in the survival mode, we could end up wasting our life and spending our entire life in the survival mode. Waiting for something else or waiting for this or waiting for that. You know, we've also had a number of people suggesting that the COVID-19 pandemic would be over by Easter, Easter 2020. 2020 Easter. As a matter of fact, there was even some people trying to prophesy that. People predicting that, all kinds of stuff. Guess what? It wasn't over. And then it was summer. And then it was fall. And then it was Christmas 2020. And then it was Easter of 2021, and here we are the week after Easter, and the restrictions have been increased, and the pandemic continues. If you've been in survival mode, you've been 14 months in survival mode, 13 and a half months, roughly. Some of us have adopted a survival attitude of complacency, just simply waiting for this pandemic stuff to end. Here's the reality, that whatever happens in the future, we're not going back to life as it was pre-pandemic. Life will have changed on the other side of this journey. So what can we learn from what God was asking the Israelites to do in the city where they had been carried exile to? And we pick it up in verse 5 of Jeremiah 29, and here's what he says. Build houses and settle down plant gardens and eat what they produce. I saw a a thing on the news report recently that we could have a shortage of gardens. Everybody's into gardening now. (laughs) Anyway, that's a good thing. But then he says, marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and daughters and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. In other words, he's saying, Build homes. Build your home. Establish a positive physical presence in the neighborhood in Babylon. Become part of the economy of the city of Babylon. Be a positive force in Babylon. You know, in the same way, we should be a positive force in our neighborhood, wherever we are, where God has placed us. We need to take care of our home. We need to keep the lawn neatly trimmed. We need to keep the driveway shoveled. We need to be a good neighbor. We need to be caring for our neighbors. And then he said, marry. And I can just see some young single guy saying, yeah, I I get that. That's what I want to do. (laughs) Marry. But the Jews were actually planning on leaving Babylon as soon as possible. And they said, hey, I don't want to complicate things with a romantic relationship. Jeremiah is saying, get married. Now, certainly we see in Scripture that God has given to some the gift of singleness. And I just want to affirm that gift today. It is a gift. And it's a calling to those to whom God has given it to. And I want to say, don't just survive that. Thrive in that and the opportunities that that presents. But Jeremiah was not addressing those who were called to the life of singleness. Rather, he is addressing those who were intentionally putting off marriage because they were in exile. You know, in our culture today, there are some that are just putting off marriage or giving up on marriage. And many that are married are simply surviving in their marriages. I want to encourage you today. If your marriage isn't thriving, I encourage you to get help. Contact one of our pastoral team, and we can connect you with some really good resources. And some there's we have amazing mentor couples for marriage in our church, and we can connect you with one of those couples that can walk with you, and you can see your marriage move from surviving to thriving. It's worth investing in it. 
Get help. It's worth it. It's worth it. Then he said, also increase the number. Studies show that for a culture to maintain itself for more than 25 years, there needs to be a minimum birth rate of 2.11 children per set of parents. Anybody know what Canada's birth rate is right now? It's 1.47 right now. That means that Canadian culture, as we know it today, will not maintain itself in its present form. Canada will continue to need significant immigration to sustain itself. Now, Jeremiah knew that the Jews would be in Babylon for 70 years. And the primary way for them to maintain their culture and to carry on as a sustainable people group was through fertility. So that's why he said, get married, increase the number, have families. And you know, solid, fruitful, productive families are a tremendous blessing to a city. Did you, did you know that? Our families can have a significant impact on the culture in our city here. There's no doubt today that Satan has a major war aimed against the family. He knows that if he can successfully destroy families, he will destroy our city and our nation. So building strong families, it's a way to reduce crime, it's a way to improve the economy, and it's a way to build a healthy, thriving city. Then Jeremiah says, going on in verse 7, Focusing on the first part, also seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Now, the Hebrew word that is translated peace here is shalom, and it carries with the meaning with it the meaning of wholeness or well-being. In other words, seek the wholeness or the well-being of the city to where I have placed you. Interesting that God would say that to people in exile, to people who are in a place where they don't want to be, a place they didn't choose to go, and he's saying, make the best of your life where you are right now. I think there's a translatable principle. We need to make the best of our life where we are at right now. And he said to them, seek the peace and the prosperity of the city through involvement. Don't just survive. Invest into the culture. Invest into the culture. I didn't say let the culture form your values or your worldview. Not at all. As a matter of fact, we need to be ensuring that the scriptures are forming our values and our worldview. But he said invest into the culture. This is the directive. Seek is actually an action word. God is saying to the exiles, I am commanding you, I am telling you to seek the peace and prosperity of the city where you are living right now. The many Christians over the centuries have clearly understood this command and they have sacrificed their lives for the welfare of society. They were the initiators in the fields of health care Education, science, technology. It can be said that Christianity has produced more literate and educated people than any other movement in the history of mankind. For example, in the United States, 123 of the first 126 colleges that were established, they were established by Christians. Science has many Christian roots. Many of the early scientists were Christians, Galileo, Pascal, Isaac Newton, and many others. These great scientists operated within a Christian world view. So today, perhaps in a place where you don't want to be, with circumstances that you don't want to have, you are called by God to work for the peace and the prosperity and the welfare of the city where you are living. We are called as Christ followers to be involved in the various spheres that influence society. And many of these spheres, unfortunately, Christians are abandoning and retreating into their Christian bubble. For example, government. We need Christ followers in government. 
and in the bureaucracy of government. We need Christ followers in education, in science, in technology, in media. What an incredible place for Christ followers to be, to be influencing culture through media. And then through arts and entertainment, a powerful place of influence for Christ followers. Somebody said... Let me write the lyrics for the songs of your nation and I will have more uh, influence than those that write the, the laws of your nation. Arts and entertainment, huge, huge place of influence. And then, of course, religion or the church. The church should have influence in culture. And then family, our family should be influencing the culture. And then business and commerce, the amazing ways that culture and the city and the gospel can be furthered through business. So whether you work in government, private business, whether you work in a charity or maybe in a non-profit, or if you're a student or a stay-at-home parent or self-employed, or maybe retired, we all have a key role in contributing to the welfare of the city. Never underestimate the positive influence that you can bring right where you are. And I continue to be amazed about the creative ways that the people of Calvary community are involved in making this city a better place. Uh, a, a few months ago, one of our media teams went out to the residence of one of the people from our church, uh, Bill and Betty Fox. Uh, Bill uh, was the former chairman of the Board of Elders for years, a teacher involved in so many ministries here. Uh, also had a, a number of businesses he was involved in, computer consulting and so forth, leadership and management things. Anyway, professionally retired now, but not retired from the kingdom, uh, Bill started a project in his garage, and the media team went out there to see Bill, and we're going to watch that now as they play that. I, I jokingly say that my prime objective is to make noise and sawdust, and I do very well at that. I want to introduce you to more than a carpenter ministries. Uh, I started in a little over a year ago now where I built a uh, wooden truck out of a chunk of two by four. And I'm looking to distribute it to children in need and in stress situations. I envisage, you know, kids in the the hospital and I don't know how else to describe it, but uh, you know, breakup of a home, uh, illnesses, accidents, what, whatever, those sort of things. But uh, uh, you know, kids kind of just tag along through those sorts of things and sometimes get lost. I want them to have a special, uh, you know, truck that they can go on a trip to wherever they want in their imagination. When I was about four years old, I think it was, there was great mystery around our house. Uh, My dad would come home from work and uh, he would go down the basement and we could hear banging and thumping going on downstairs. And my my dad had built me a plane, I had a wing fan about so much. At at four years old, I didn't think about all of the hours that it took for him to, but uh, over the years, as I got older and realized just how much that that it took him to do, you know, and it was it, it was a very special toy. And I mean, what I would give today to, to be able to, you know, to find that plane. But uh, yeah, it it was really a special a special piece for me. Ten, twelve years ago, uh, I saw a video of a uh, church ministry from somewhere down in the States that that they were taking in uh, furniture and refinishing it and repairing it and then making it available to give away. And they, 
Uh, they also made toys for kids. You know, I, I mentioned it to a number of people, and everybody that I talked to said, hey, that sounds like a great idea. We, we should do that, shouldn't we? <laughs> there, there was never a place to do it. And it just, you know, the, the, the vision for it kind of went up and down over the years. It uh, sometimes just didn't do anything. And, and finally I said, I've got to get back at this. And, it, and it, the, the big vision isn't coming together. I didn't do what I could have done. And I just think for 10 years, if I'd been making these and giving them out to kids, how many kids could I could have been blessed? And so uh, for me, I just said, you know, I've got to get at this and start doing this. And I wonder how many other people are, you know, whatever their ministry might be, are held back from taking that first step into the smaller, at the smaller scale because of the vision of the great big scale. Don't put off getting involved. I don't know whether any, you know, for anybody else, <clears throat> are you putting off getting involved in whatever the ministry might be that you're that you have the talent to do. It may not be making trucks, but whatever it is, you know, what are, what are you what are you doing? If anybody knows a child or a contact to uh, to any you know, pediatric ward or to a uh, uh, <clears throat> woman's shelter or or whatever, just let me know. You know, I mean, I, that's my. That's what I want to do. Uh, uh, likewise, is, is that uh, if anybody would like to help uh, make them, hey, uh, we'll get together, I'll provide the coffee and the tools, and uh, uh, we'll just set a day and go and do it. My admonition, if you will, is to uh, do what you can do, and do it now. Isn't that exciting? Yeah, I think we need to celebrate that. Wow. Uh, Bill's words just strike me. Do what you can do, and do it now. Do it now. Don't wait. Do it now. Uh, Bill's at the uh, has a display set up at the back for those that are here in person. You can stop by, see him there, chat with him. Uh, he he's got some exciting uh, uh, stories of of kids that have received these uh, uh, toys. I, I saw a picture yesterday of somebody at the stall re, uh, going through crisis that Bill had uh, was able to connect with a, one of these toys. If you know a child in crisis, let Bill know. Uh, and if you're watching online. And uh, you want to contact Bill, just uh, get a hold of us uh, through online and we'll put you in touch uh, with Bill. Uh, also, you might have a different vision and you might be uh, saying, I don't know how to start. Well, Bill's got piles of experience and leadership and he's also available to hear your dream and to just talk with you and say, how can we start? What can we do? And you know what? We're always looking to start the big venture when in fact we need to take that first step. So I encourage you, uh, if, what, if you've got something on your heart, connect with Bill. And thank you, Bill, for the example, how in retirement from our professional career, we don't retire from the kingdom and we can continue to make a difference. Praise the Lord. And uh, you know, as a church family, there's stories like this all over the place. Thank you, Calvary Community Church, for making a difference. And thank you for not just surviving and for continuing to thrive. And I want to say thank you to our elders for their vision that we continue to move forward. Our mission statement as a church is that we exist to make disciples who make disciples. That's our mission statement. And you know, uh, this January, when we met as an elder team, well aware that the pandemic realities and restrictions and all that stuff that goes with it likely is going to be with us for this next year, we set goals for 2021, goals that were not just about surviving, but goals to thrive as a church. And so our goals for 2021, I want to remind you, 
that we are believing for 52 decisions for Christ this week, this year, one person per week on average coming to Jesus Christ. You'll see that there's a light up behind me. And we had that light sit up last week representing somebody that had come to Christ the previous week, but we didn't celebrate it publicly, so we thought we'd put it up again this week when I talk about this, and we can celebrate that decision for Jesus Christ publicly today. Praise the Lord for number nine, the ninth person to cross that line of faith. Praise you, Jesus. And then we're believing for 4,500 people from the community to be touched with the love of Christ through, this, uh, through the people here, through the ministry here. And that's apart from our regular services, of course, on Sunday morning. And then we're believing for 200 people in small groups. And moving forward, small groups are one of the key ways that we're going to make disciples. Actually, we believe that disciples are best made in the context of a small group through relationship. So we are really going to be focusing on that. As a matter of fact, we spent a whole day yesterday with a consulting group and with our leadership working through that. And we're believing by next fall going into the end of the year, we've got over 200 people in small groups. Then engagement. Engagement is going to drive the post-pandemic church is what they're saying. And we're believing for more people to be engaged in the ministry here, at least 30 volunteers. I think that's low, but that's what we're believing for uh, in uh, 2021. And you know a church is made up of what? People, right? So we've set some personal goals for all of us, and uh, we set the goal that uh, one, uh, two, at least two times per quarter, we're going to have a spiritual conversation with somebody outside the church building, outside of the ministry context, but in the community, in our workplace, or whatever. Uh, we're going to have a spiritual conversation. And also, that we're going to, per quarter, at least to two invites to in-person church or online church. So that's exciting. And so we want to thrive as a church in 2021, not just survive. We're not just sitting back and waiting for the pandemic stuff to end. We want to thrive now. So Jeremiah, continuing on, he says, pray, continuing on in verse, uh, chapter 29, verse 7, he says, pray to the Lord for the city, for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Pray for this city. Pray for this city. Last Thursday night, we had a one-hour prayer slot in the Zoom prayer meeting that was a 24-hour prayer meeting hosted by the Edmonton House of Prayer, which Tammy, our prayer coordinator, uh, uh, led our hour, and a number of us joined. But I want to encourage you, uh, we've joined on Zoom for the prayer. I want to encourage you, pray for the city. Because if it prospers, you too will, be, will prosper. And actually, the word prosper could also be translated thrive. As we get involved in seeking the shalom, the peace, and prosperity of the, of the city, by our involvement and through prayer, the city will prosper and thrive. And you will thrive too. And you know, thriving begins with trusting Jesus. That's where thriving begins, by trusting Jesus Christ. And in John chapter 10, verse 10, we read, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's the enemy. And I think he's doing a pretty good job of that, isn't he? He's, been, he's killing, stealing, and destroying. But here is the good news. Here's the second half of that verse. And by the way, we need to focus on the second half. I think we're focusing too much on what the enemy is doing, and we got to focus more on what Jesus is doing and what he's done. And Jesus says this, I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Jesus came and he stepped on the head of the serpent, the enemy at the cross. He defeated the enemy. The Satan is defeated. And we need to stop settling for less than what Jesus has already paid for. Stop settling for less than what he's paid for. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, we can thrive 
in life. Thriving begins with trusting Jesus. And you might be here this morning, or you might be watching online today, and you might realize as you've been listening to this that you have never came to the place where you've opened up your heart and you've invited Jesus Christ to come in and to be Lord and Savior of your life. And today, he's knocking. He's knocking at the door of your life. And he gives us a choice. We can open the door and invite him in. Or we can say, no, I want to continue to do life on my own. But I want to encourage you to make that choice, to open the door, to receive him in. I'm so thankful I did that years ago, and it's made all of the difference for me. And I just want to encourage you to take that step as well this morning. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. I'd ask you all to join in the prayer. And we're going to invite Jesus to come and to be Lord and Savior of our, of our lives. Today, Lord Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And Lord Jesus, I believe you rose again on the third day. I believe in you. And today, I open up the door to my life, the door to my heart, my mind, will, and emotions. And I invite you to come in and to be my Savior to come in and to bring your abundant life into me. I receive you today by faith. Thank you. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today for the first time, coming up on the screen is a number uh, that I'd like to take you to take out your cell phone and just text LIFE to 587-323-1199. And as you text that number, it will give us an opportunity to send you an online resource called Next. Next Steps about how to follow Jesus. And we're so excited for that decision that you've made today. If you're here in person, I'd love to meet you in person. And I can share uh, those resources with you in, in a booklet form. Or I can, we can also send them to you uh, online. God bless you. And thank you for taking that step uh, th this morning. You know, I was thinking of a verse out of Proverbs that talks about that a generous man who refreshes others will be refreshed himself. Have you found that as you start giving out of yourself and start touching others, helping others, suddenly you get refreshed, you start thriving, and, and God wants you to thrive. He wants us to be living the abundant life. And he's got a specific purpose for each and every one of you. Each and every day we're on this earth, he has a purpose for us. And he's created you to live life to the fullest. And you know what? Even in the middle of the deepest trial, even in the middle of a pandemic, even in the middle of circumstances that we would not have chosen, by grace, we can say, God, I thrust you. I put my trust in you, and God, I am choosing that I am going to thrive, not just survive. So my question is, as we end today, are you surviving or are you thriving? Remember, thriving begins with trusting Jesus. Thanks for joining us. If you need anything, don't hesitate to contact us. You can find more information on our website or on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. We'll see you again soon.